This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to this week's edition of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. I'm your host, Adam the Jock Straczynski. On today's show, lots of injury updates and news, as well as where this big WWE star will be rehabbing while he's waiting to come back to the ring. Of course, we got some, uh, sounds like we got some Drew McIntyre news, uh, as well as possibly some CM Punk news. So you're going to want to stick around, hear all of that. We're going to take a look at what took place on in AEW. We're going to take a look at what went on in WWE and doing it with me as always. He's the one. He's the only. He is the Doc John Macaroon. What's up, cuz? Interesting week of professional wrestling. Lots of storylines moving forward. AEW put on a great dynamite. Lots of interesting things to get into, man. I'm excited for this week. Yeah, it should be a really good breakdown for us. Let's jump right into to WWE. And the biggest story in WWE is the bloodline storyline. And I think what we got on Monday compared to what we got on Friday was a little bit different with the bloodline. On Monday, we had the bloodline working in conjunction with the judgment day in a, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. And I thought this was interesting because it looked like WWE was trying to do something different with the bloodline and their storyline. Uh, At this point, the Bloodline storyline's been going on for the better part of two and a half, three years, somewhere right around there, and it's been very good. It's been very, very good. I think at this point, it's starting to get a little bit stale, uh, especially when when we compare that to what we got on Friday night with the match against Matt Riddle. It was a Bloodline storyline. You knew there was going to be some outside interference. They removed the disqualification clause, so there was no DQ. It's one of those things where I think you're really trying to build Solo Sokoa up. So you're going to get a very trite and a very copy-paste type of finish to that to that match. I'm fine with it, and it's sometimes predictable is good as long as it makes sense. And in this case, I feel like it makes sense because you're trying to build Solo Sokoa up. But what we got on Monday, them working with the Judgment Day was something that I really enjoyed. It was something different. It was a new it was a new take. And I think this really helped the Judgment Day. Specifically, I think this really helped one person. I thought standing in that ring when they were talking across from each other, I thought Damian Priest looked like an absolute star. I think Damian Priest looked like he should be the leader of the Judgment Day. Now, Finn Balor is the pseudo leader of the Judgment Day. But to me, it felt and it looked like Damian Priest should have been the leader of the Judgment Day. Damian Priest has a star quality about him, as well as Rhea Ripley, that the other two just don't have. And that's tough for me to say because I really do feel like Finn Balor, everything he's done in his career, the dude is a legit star. Dominic Mysterio, we can go any direction you want to go with that. But to me, what I took out of it was, I liked the new attempt. I liked them trying something different. I don't necessarily think it worked as well as they had hoped, but I liked them trying something different with the bloodline, and I liked the fact that it was the Judgment Day, and I liked that Damian Priest looks and feels like he's a star, and it really does feel like he should be pushed to the moon. Uh, again, Rhea Ripley is is already an absolute star. She she looks like a freaking killer. Her and Solo Sokoa having their stare down. A little bit of sexual tension there. Uh, a little bit of I want to rip your throat out there. It was a whole lot of everything. I loved it. I thought it was great. W- w- what's your take on on them basically doing the same thing on SmackDown, but trying something new with the Judgment Day on Monday Night Raw? Yeah, absolutely, and that, that's what we kind of need to see post-WrestleMania is the emergence of new stars, and Damian Priest fits the bill. It is interesting, too, though, because you got to ask yourself, what does this mean for Finn Balor? Because it just kind of seemed like the feud with Edge didn't do what it would need to do, kind of, to elevate him yep. moving forward, so it's kind of like plateaued, and I feel like his involvement in the Judgment Day hasn't really done anything meaningful for the Judgment Day. I mean, you could have legitimately probably left Finn off of the Judgment Day and it would have been maybe even better. I think Damian Priest 
the emerging Dom as he kind of gets his way and feels a little bit more comfortable in the ring, then you get a sense that Rhea can be, you know, that kind of badass leader of the group on the women's side. So I think the Judgment Day could go down to three and it'd be no problem. Finn Balor, I think, is a legitimate star and he's been held back. Damien Priest can only benefit. For me, did I like it? I thought it was unique. Has the bloodline feud gotten stale? Yeah, I think it's not stale, it's plateaued in that it was ascending week after week leading up to WrestleMania with what's happening, the tease with Sami Zayn because we were invested more. So this is kind of a reset and trying to get people more involved in what's going on. And obviously we're seeing Solo Sokoa emerge. But yeah, and it's it's unfortunate because they keep writing it the same way, which is, okay, wrestling is a weekly product. So when you have run-ins every single match, it, it, it does have the significant law of diminishing return. And Solo Sokoa is bad enough to just beat Riddle clean. He doesn't really, in the end, need his brothers to help him but this is what heels do but see this is where creativity and those that uh, opine that wwe lacks creativity this is tried and true heel and face okay what you do is heels do heel things and they cheat they it's, it's, it's a formula now what we're saying here in my chair is there has to be a new updated creative way where heels do things to upset the face and it's just, it's tough to think about on the fly, but that's what WWE is paid to do is to be the advanced storytelling organization, especially entertainment. Maybe it's, it's, it's social media, maybe it's uh, messaging, maybe it's uh, so stuff done outside the ring, but heels just have to find new ways of upsetting the apple cart other than just running in during matches because it's played out and it's pissing off a lot of people in the in the bloodline feud but Damian Priest should elevate himself and should find an opportunity to be in more high profile matches that's what we want to see great you're involved you're, you're kind of the enforcer of the bloodline now maybe take an opportunity and take someone out I mean it's to me the whole thing with with Damian Priest him standing across from from a guy like Paul Heyman Paul Heyman's been basically a foundational piece in wrestling for since we were kids there was no quiver. There was no shiver. There was no shake in that man at all. He was like, Paul. And like, he like, like he, he seemed like he belonged. It seemed like he fit. It didn't seem like he was like the moment was too big for him. And that's what I think impressed me most about Damian priest. Now you're right. As far as the bloodline goes and the storytelling goes, Solo's code doesn't need any help. Like he is, he is badass enough. And you've done a really good job of building him up in the short amount of time that he's been with the bloodline. You don't necessarily need the outside interference all the time. Now, what you could do is you could do something different. Now, I, on Friday night, you had the, the female tag team champs basically resort to heel tactics to win. You know, you can have – you can do different things. You can wear different shoes. Do you know what I'm saying? You can have a, a, a heel do a face-like move. You can have a heel do a, 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 a heel-type move. You can do these different things as long as it helps progress the story. And I feel like with, with where we're at with the bloodline, they do need to freshen it up a little bit. I thought it was a really good match. I enjoyed that match. I thought the, the main event was awesome on Friday night with Matt Riddle and Sola Sokoa. thought it was really, really good. Don't necessarily think you needed to to copy and paste something that you've done three or four times. I get what you're trying to do, and it does help kind of move the story along a little bit. But at the same time, you can throw throw us something new, throw us a little bit of a curveball. Something that was a bit of a curveball, uh, and I didn't really get. And I'm hoping you can help me understand what we got there. What do you make of this so-called Cody and Brock segment? Basically, you got Cody Rhodes in the ring. Adam Pierce comes down. He's like, "You're not comp- You're not cleared to do anything." You basically got to sit on the shelf. Uh, Brock comes out looking like he belongs, like he's the cowboy version of the Matrix, and 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 he's up there at the at the top of the ramp. Doesn't say anything. Doesn't really address Cody Rhodes at all. Cody got another good promo. Uh, next thing you know, Cody is is fighting twenty security guards for a dude who's not medically cleared to do anything. Uh, he can ward off twenty security guards, no problem. Also, WWE had no problem with him wrestling with uh, with a torn pec in a steel cage against Seth Rollins uh, about a year ago. So 
what are we doing here? What was the segment? Like I told you last week, I want to hear what, what, why Brock did it. I want to hear from Brock. I want to know what his perspective was. And still a week later, I'm left wanting that. I didn't get what this segment was there to accomplish because it didn't accomplish anything in my, in my estimation. They accomplished that Cody's mad and he's viciously going to attack Brock Lesnar, <laughs> you know, which is probably how it was written on the paper. Cody's pissed, needs to viciously attack Brock. Elevate story. Good shit. You know, exactly. And it's not high level. And for me, I, I would have just loved to see him face to face. And yeah, a little bit of physicality. They've used that angle and that bit far too often. Again, it's played out. And they just act like these wrestling fans haven't seen it a thousand times. And it was just funny. Uh, I think you had mentioned or, or I had mentioned it's it, it just a funny thing that, man, WWE security never seems to be able to keep the wrestlers away from each other because all they do is get their ass beat every time they step foot in the ring. So I would look at it like they obviously want to establish the emotional character of Cody Rhodes, that he everything that he goes through is heightened to a, a nth degree, and you don't need it. I mean, Cody Rhodes just getting his ass beat by Brock Lesnar, for me, told the story enough. Okay, he's now in a uh, precarious situation. Yeah, let, it's time for now Brock to uh, address what's going on, and, and you don't even have to have in-ring action. Again, they just, I mean, literally... They could have so much good content if they just sat Brock down and asked him, why would you do that? And you give Brock a good three, four minutes to talk about it, and you keep it moving. And then Cody can come down to the ring and address it and stuff like that. You, you just got to be a little bit more creative in pushing along this feud. But that's what they wanted to do, man. Cody was blocked by the security just so that – and it's I get it. It's like that tease. It's like there's a barrier to getting what we want. It's all psychological, it's all manipulation, but it's all been done a million times before. Even AEW's done it. So when you've seen it a thousand times, it just doesn't do anything. It doesn't elicit that same response because the first thing we think about is, God, here we go, security trying to hold back two people. And there's always that one scene where the, the, the wrestler, the guy that's getting his ass beat, has to push through and breaks through the, the little wall. I'm like, oh my God, dude. In real life, if someone's holding you down, you're not moving. And th there does need to be a little bit more added element of realism in trying to do this. But for me, I just laughed it off and was like, okay, they did it again. And, and I just, it didn't hit, it hit the target for me. Yeah, it was a total swing and miss for me. I just did not get it. Something else that I didn't get uh, on Friday night, I'm not sure if you caught it. They did a quick screen grab. <laughs> and they mentioned that we got Seth Rollins versus Omos. Uh, it's taking place at Backlash. Uh, there's been no build for this. This is new. Uh, to me, if you want a sign of Vince McMahon having some creative control, it will be this match right here. I don't know how you take a, a Seth Rollins who's had zero interaction with Omos and slap him in a ring in a match against a guy who really shouldn't be on television yet. I, this is shocking. I don't know how we got here because we just got here. Like we just showed up one day and they're like, Hey, this is what's going on to me. It, it, this seems like, like Vince is like, Hey man, we got to get almost in the ring. We need to get him more reps. We got to do it on a pay-per-view. He's a big guy. He's like seven, seven, and he's a monster. Who can we put him in there with? Who works really well? Seth, you're not doing nothing. Let's give him Seth. What are we doing here? Like, like to me, it feels like Seth Rollins really, really should be pissed off, really upset with creative. The fact that you're putting him in a, in this match with this guy off of zero build, like there's been no build. And like, we will probably get it in the next two weeks because backlash takes place in two weeks, I believe. So we'll probably get it in two weeks. But you mean to tell me you're going to give me a two week build for a Seth Rollins match? What are we doing? Like, what the hell are we actually doing here? I don't know, man. This was, I feel like this is like dumb to the nth degree. This was shocking that, that, that this was even put up on a graphic and presented to television. It blew my mind that we've got Seth Rollins versus almost. I was like, what the, what is going on here? Dude, what, what, what did you think about this? Yeah. Seth Rollins is a throw together kind of wrestler. That doesn't make any sense. Throwing something together for Seth Rollins is crazy, but it's one of those matches where not everything can have a build. I don't understand what the point is going to be because Omos should take the loss easily. Um, 
I I guess the idea is we're just going to continue now to build Seth Rollins. Now he gets to beat Omos. But Omos is a joke. Like, the dude's like a big freak. He's a big enhancement talent. And whatever they've done in order to try and elevate him is, is kind of hilarious when you present this big monster that keeps losing all the time. He's got to take the L. So, yeah, it was funny to see. You feel bad for Seth Rollins because you do feel like this is a main event player, and obviously he's ascending in that direction. He just has great matches. He commands the screen. I mean, look, I'll say this. Credit to everyone involved. I thought the match of the week, if you really want to look at it, if you can only watch one match this week, The Miz and Seth Rollins tore the house down with great psychology. It was a great match. Great match, great psychology. Um, I think I read it was produced by Shane Helms, if I'm accurate, and it was just... An amazing, well done match, and that's the the caliber of performer that you have. So you better do him right because putting him in a match with Omos, it's kind of like a a, a, a a raw match that you're putting on a pay per view. I mean, like, think about this: Wouldn't you have much rather seen Seth Rollins versus The Miz capitalize off that great yeah, match that you match. had on yes, Monday night? Yes, and, and capitalize on their history and do a two week build for that. Like you could really draw something. In the next two weeks from that, you could have Miz show up on Monday night. We could do uh, Miz TV. He could call out Seth Rollins, and he could be pissed that Seth Rollins beat him last week. And you could get this more serious version of The Miz taking on Seth Rollins. I would love to see that. I think that would be much better than whatever we're going to get with Omos. What is Omos? It just doesn't make sense. I mean, yeah, he's big, but I think he doesn't even need to have matches. He just needs to kind of be stalking. I mean, if you want to take a slow build – um, the man should just be kind of just popping up places where you're like, oh, where's Omos going to pop up next? Where he's just kind of probing. Maybe he shows up in the Cody match. He's just standing there. You know, you got to do something more creative with these guys. And it just hasn't happened. And Omos, Seth, I mean, okay, it'll be a probably a nine-minute match. Seth goes over, and we keep it pumping, keep it moving. I don't even know if it'll be nine minutes. You might give right. him nine minutes just because it's Seth. Almost usually his matches top out at about five so yeah, you're right, Seth. I mean, if Seth Seth loses that match, oh. that that I think tells you there there are rumors going around that Seth is upset with WWE and, and some of the stuff going on in the back. If Seth loses that match, that tells you that there might be a little bit of validity to those rumors. And if almost goes over, I think it gives you the clear indication that that Vince has a little bit more control creatively than we are all led to believe. Uh, this is. Um, Conspiracy. I just I don't I just don't get it, man. I just don't I don't understand it. It's nuts to me. Uh, let's transition over to AEW. I thought on Wednesday night we got a a really great promo. Uh, we've got MJF, we got Darby Allen, uh, we had Jungle Boy Jack Perry, and we had a another Pillars promo. And this was interesting because all these guys got to, to basically come out and they all kind of got to take shots at each other again and call each other out. And I think as this kind of unfolds, you do see how much further ahead MJF is up compared to everybody else. Uh, but Jack Perry, his big one, his one big issue was actually cutting a promo in front of a live crowd. He's gotten much better at that. Darby Allen, I think, does a really great job of conveying his story. I thought this was a, a really nice setup for what we ended up getting later on in the night where we had uh, Darby Allen or we had we had Jungle Boy and we had Sammy Guevara taking each other on uh, in a match. And it's basically there's been this little bit of a gauntlet match that MJF has set up where uh, Darby Allen gets a pass, but. Jungle Boy and Sammy Guevara have to go through each other. The winner of that will take on Darby Allen, and then the winner of that will face MJF at all in. I I thought this was a really good setup. I thought this was a a good idea to kind of give us a little bit of direction as to where we were going. What did you think about the promos? And what did you what's just your overall what's your overall impression of these four guys, especially when they stand in the ring across from each other? Because to me, MJF is heads and tails above everybody else in that ring. Yeah, it's oh, – and the crowd, it kind of indicates that too. When he comes out, it kind of adds the spice that we're all looking for. So for me, obviously, Jungle Jack Perry, uh, Jungle Boy isn't the guy for me. I think obviously he's the lowest rated. I think Darby Allen is kind of the enhancement you know, role in that I think that he can put, put on a great match but still needs to have more believable feuds and wins to kind of elevate himself. 
And Sammy Guevara is the guy. I mean, that's the that's the guy. He's fluid. He's got all the tools similar to MJF. And I love the fact that they played it up with, okay, um, you know, Sammy Guevara is the kind of guy that would take MJF's money. to. But see, here's the thing, too, which is the the angry, pissed MJF was way better than what we got at the end in the match where he's all trying to, like, manhump Sammy Guevara. That was not really appealing because he comes off looking silly. He's all trying to hug him, like... It just comes off as looking a little bit meek in my mind. You just want to have MJF on his two feet, smiling, laughing. You don't have to do the – because that doesn't come off as natural. It comes off as fake, and I didn't like that in, in regards to how that played out on television, how it looked. It looked kind of stupid. But Sammy Guevara has all the tools, and he's like a natural. He moves around the ring so fluidly. He's believable, and that's why if – AEW legitimately had a title like the Intercontinental title. Sammy Guevara is the guy. You just give it to him and you can let him run with it and, and, and elevate himself. But he's got, I mean, he does the Spanish, he actually makes the Spanish fly look kind of easy where you're like, you know what? I could actually get up there and, and grab a guy's neck and flip him over. And he did it once on the top rope and then once on the, on the side of the ring. And just Sammy Guevara is awesome. He's the guy that should be m- moving forward. And then uh, Darby Allen can feud with uh, Jack Perry and they can figure out how to elevate each other. But I did like the Sting reference. I did like um, how they're using and incorporating moving forward. But I don't see them as being the pillars. I see, obviously, I see Sammy Guevara as something to work with. But those guys aren't the pillars. The pillars are guys like Daniel Garcia, the guys like Wheeler Yuta, guys like that that are more believable as tough guys that can get in the ring, I think are a little bit more believable than Darby Allen and Jungle Boy Jack Perry, especially coming off of the fact that, uh, you know, they're a little bit, you know, unfortunately they're cruiserweights. You can't have cruiserweights be the pillar of your company. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. I feel like it's a little bit of an old WWE mindset. Like you can't have cruiserweights. If you ask me back when WCW was, was really gaining momentum, the cruiserweights were were the guys that really helped move most of that machine forward because there were one so many of them and some of their matches were the best thing on television that night because some of the stuff like the NWO was captivating but some of the storytelling with the NWO was no no it, it felt it, like they ran out of material after about 6 months for me it harkened so, back, no for me it harkened back to a promoter i'm not sure if it was Eric Bischoff if it was one of the old school Verganias or someone that said you know, really, the gimmick is really important. Could you see Jungle Boy holding a world title and then having that on the marquee? Come see Jungle Boy, you know, that's as opposed to come see Roman Reigns. That's the difference. He's got to change his persona a little bit as well. But at, the, sure. at the same time, when he goes up against the likes of, a, let's just say, for example, a Jack Hagar or a different caliber of performer, you're talking about world title. I mean, when, when I look at these belts that are sitting in front of me, I got an AEW belt and the old wingtip here staring right in my face. I look at the total package, which is size, speed, uh, agility, available, healthy, can talk, and people would pay to see. And you have to have all that. Like Roman Reigns sounds like, okay, a world champion. And... And, and and obviously the, when he shows up, yeah, when he shows up, the latest uh, <laughs> the latest version was when uh, Roman said it. He said Dusty came to him and said, "Boy, you got it, and nobody can tell you you don't got it because I see it, and everybody knows you got it." And when I see Jungle Boy Jack Perry and Darby Allen, I'm not seeing you got it. I'm like, okay, show up, have a good match, and uh, do your thing. And 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 that just speaks to character development. They got to do more with these guys to True. get them if they want to be viewed as a war, a pillar. Okay, I get what they're saying is that you guys are next. But at the same time, I, I can make arguments for others. And you can't have that. If you're a pillar, like, it's no doubt. Like, Chris Jericho and Dean Malenko and, and uh, Chris Benoit, those were Eddie pillars. Guerrero. Eddie Guerrero. Those guys, you could legitimately say, wow, because they had years and years of great matches well before they were targeted. I just think that they've been called pillars without having to earn it just yet. Sammy's getting there, and he's done enough to put himself in that conversation where it's believable. The other two, they need more. And it For sure. Happen. And it look, look I, I agree. I agree with a lot of what you said. I, I, it makes a hundred and ten percent sense what you said. I think if you had to rank them, right? It is. It is MJF, and it's by a long shot. After that, it is. It is Sammy Guevara, and then I think after that, it is Darby Allen, and then I think in the distance, it is. It is probably Jungle Boy Jack, and, and it's just kind of how that's how I see it. I think you're right. 
Jack Perry's gimmick and, and Jack Perry's package needs to be redone. And maybe that's what we get out of all of this. Maybe when all this is said and done, we get a repackaged Jungle Boy. Maybe it's something a little bit more believable. Maybe it's something a little bit more, I don't know, championship worthy. Uh, I think you're right with with Darby Allen. Darby Allen, Darby Allen has has crazy upper mid card all over him, right? For sure. Like the like the dude can go in the ring and do anything and everything with anybody. I don't know how long his body's going to hold up with the stuff he does. I think at some point it's going to catch up to him, and then. You just brought it up. One of the things that, that you look for in a champion is is the availability. Well, you're not available if you're hurt. So I think he does have to modify some of his in-ring work. And I think him modifying some of his in-ring work and and maybe presenting himself with a little bit of a curve, you know, just change it a little bit. You know, like I, I, I get what, what he is. I get where he's coming from. I get I get his character, but maybe maybe put a little bit of English on it. And switch it up just a little bit. Maybe then that helps elevate you. But you're right. Sammy Guevara. Sammy Guevara has the look. Sammy Guevara has the moves. Sammy Guevara can get in a ring and compete with big guys. And you're not like, oh, it's going to be an automatic loss. Uh, Sammy Guevara would look good holding a championship. We've seen him hold the championship. We've seen him hold the TNT championship, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. Because I've got a question. What the hell is the point of the TNT championship at this point? But... You you can tell MJF is the guy. Like, it clicks. It works. It, he is the guy. Sammy Guevara is is the second guy. Like like you said, if there was a second tier championship that meant anything in that company, Sammy Guevara could could carry it for sure. And there's three more guys that I just came to mind at the top of my uh, list: Ricky Starks, Jay White. And Takeshka, all guys that I want to give more TV time to. I mean, Jay White walks out there. And he has star written all over him. Like his music is great. It's enticing. It's menacing. He moves flawlessly in the ring. He's got the badass persona. I get that, you know, the first match you're going to have was against Commander, which is great because they can put together a great match. But Jay White is a star. And he look, it to- was a great match, but command like that match was made to make Commander look good. Yeah, exactly. Like, but I, I exactly. Jay White got little to no offense, and then he hit a Blade Runner, won the match, and you're like, what the? Fuck? Exactly. What <laughs> Jay White needs to be elevated. This is a superstar worldwide. Like you, you don't need all that time to elevate Jay White, but it's good because it's going to push forward a few of the Ricky Starks, which I do want to see. But Takeshka is believable in everything that he's done. So. I get what you're saying, pillars, is that we're going to lean on you guys, and there's a lot more connotation than just top-level athlete. But at the same time, they haven't earned it, and there's so much be- There's way better talent that deserves TV time. Literally, AEW has a world-class company, but they're investing so much time, and maybe this new TV show will put some of these people there. But literally, you have 10 wrestlers that the world would want to see week in, week out. You're only wrestling once a week. So it's got to be Chris Jericho, Takeshka, Jay White, uh, Keith Lee, FTR, weekly, consistently, uh, vignettes. It doesn't have to be matches, but the the women kind of kind of ratings killer and the pillars kind of outside of MJF, ratings killers. You got to have a little bit more emphasis on the top end stars in your, in your prime spot in AEW if you want to move forward because the ratings are dipping. People aren't invested in seeing, you know, Dr. Britt Baker get her ass beat, which was interesting, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't care. That's not what I want to see. I want to see Jay White. I want to see, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, the Bullet Club, a little bit of sprinkling of history, a little bit more about Jay White. I want to know about Takeshka. I want to see uh, Big Feuds. I want to see Ricky Starks get more time. So you, you just are kind of giving everybody a lot of appetizers and by the 15th appetizer, you're like, fucking give me a fucking lobster and steak, man. Let's go. <laughs> I'm tired of the piddly shit. I want the real shit. Let's go. I'm tired of the, I'm I'm tired, I'm tired of the artichoke and, and, and pita chips, man. It's good. It's nice. <laughs> it's tasty when you first sit down at a, at a place. But if I go to a restaurant four times a week and I get the same fucking artichoke and, 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 and pita dip, I'm like, come on, man. It's time for a filet. One of these times, hit me with the filet. Hit me with, a, hit me with something juicy. And, and, and it's there. They have it. But they're choosing to use their time to elevate shit that really, in the end, is not going to draw ratings. It's not going to draw money. It's going to – great. You're, you're elevating certain stars, but at the bottom line, it's like, uh, in the end, big promoters shouldn't spend a million dollars to try to make a million one. You spend a million dollars to try to make $25 million, and, and that's my main point. 
Yeah, I, I look. I agree with you. And in, in, in kind of speaking of ratings dips and and things that just aren't hitting the mark, I think this is a good segue to talk about the TNT Championship. You had Wardlow beat Powerhouse Hobbs <laughs> uh, after Powerhouse Hobbs beat him. I think it was three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. Like you, you basically have passed this championship belt around like a, a hooker at at a, a at a whorehouse here. Like, what are we doing? Like, give some of these guys a bit of a legit run. Give them a bit of a of a of a of a of a go with this belt and put some respect on this belt. You can look at uh, and you said it last week. You can look at what um, uh, Orange Cassidy has done with the All Elite International. We're the Universe Mexican American Pan American Championship. I don't even know what they call it anymore. He's actually given that some respect, though. Like that, that championship I view is more legitimate than your TNT Championship, which has been there from the start, which has been there since like week two of television. This was supposed to be like your TV championship. It was supposed to be you're the second guy. Like you have your championship, and then you have your second guy. We just talked about Sammy Guevara being able to hold that secondary belt. That's a belt he should be holding, and he should be holding it for a while. And you, people should be like throwing themselves at him to try to get it and trying to earn it. Instead, you basically have this like weird circle jerk with Wardlow and powerhouse Hobbs. And it just kind of keeps going around and round. If Lance Archer comes back, he'll get involved. And it's just kind of like, you know, if Samoa Joe's alive and he's not doing stuff for ring of honor, he'll get involved. It's like, you just kind of have like the same cast of characters and they're just kind of feuding over this belt and they just kind of keep exchanging it one week from the other. It, it was, it's almost like when uh, Charlotte, Bl- uh, Charlotte Flair and, and Sasha Banks spent like six weeks, seven weeks on every, on every television program that WWE had where they would win one, lose one, and they would just exchange a championship belt. And it helped inflate Charlotte's number to like 14 championships. <laughs> That's kind of where we're at right now. I don't understand the point of the TNT championship. It has zero credibility. I don't get it at all. I, I think it's meant for us to laugh when Wardlow in two years is like, and now the 16-time TNT champion, <laughs> Wardlow, about to kick your ass. You know, I've won the TNT title 16 times. That puts me on the map, bro. So l- let it be known. Wardlow's here to kick your ass 16 times. TNT champion. Yeah, exactly. It's a, you know, the, the TNT title was never really meant to be like that crazy, but you can't diminish it. And, 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 and what it does is, okay, let's move away for me from the belts, but what it does to the characters, it cheapens it because they keep taking losses to each other. Like you need to have a clear win of a feud. Like Hobbs gets a stop, a stop and start, uh, Wardlow stop and start, uh, Arn Anderson here today, gone tomorrow. So what it, it dictates? Yeah, to me, that was weird. Yeah, and I kind of get it if you think psychologically. Maybe they threw him a, a lifeline based on some tough times he's going through. And whenever uh, an athlete of that caliber, a performer, uh, a legend has some tough times outside the ring, you know, one of their great uh, saving graces is maybe the potential to do something familiar. And 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 for that, I give Tony Khan credit because it has to be what it, I think it is, which is throwing him a lifeline after a tragedy. So and, and that's cool. I, I was like, OK, it doesn't make any logical sense because. Arn Anderson came out there and he was like, man, it was like it was, it was like 1995 Arn Anderson with how bold he was. That was the best promo he gave probably in 20 years with with uh, saying that uh, Wardlow was going to play chess. I thought it was great, but yeah, it just kind of came out of the blue. But in the end, the note that I took was it kind of has the feel, and it might be, and because of how things are with Tony Khan. What made WWE successful is that they have their story booked out six months and then they work backwards. It just kind of has a feel with at least some of the mid-card stuff and the TNT title that they just go week to week and say, okay, I think Wardlow should win it this week, and they just have it. Like, literally, if you booked it out backwards, Wardlow could still be the champion from October, and now Hobbs comes in and you want to elevate him, he gets it and it means more. But now Hobbs and Wardlow look like two douches that just wrestle each other back and forth and, and give the title to each other. And, and, and it harkens back to when Sheamus and Cesaro would feud and you felt like it could do more but because they just kept going back and forth, but it never really resonated. And that's what happens when you use a title and you have performers that just keep losing to each other. Wins and losses do matter. And when wrestlers fight each other 10 times and, and, fi- and one wrestler wins five and the other wrestler wins five and you keep exchanging a title, 
You, you diminish the title and, and you diminish the two athletes that are in the mix, which is not something you're supposed to do. This needs better booking in regards to titles and runs and what it means. Maybe Wardlow will actually get the title for 30 days. Let's, let, let's put a bet over under. Does Wardlow have the title? On May 31st, does he get it? Does he get to keep it? Or does somebody else have it? I'm going to go under. I think somebody else will win it in the next four weeks. <laughs> I'll go over just to yeah. be different. But like, <laughs> if, if here's the deal. If he has it for, for 30 days, I think he probably ends up losing it on like the 31st or the 32nd. Right, right. Day. April, it's like right, just right. barely over. Right, June. The, I, I just, the, the pay-per-view. He loses at the next pay-per-view. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where Hobbs gets it. Oh. And he's like, uh, you might be the 15-time champ, but I'm Hobbs. <laughs> I'm the 20-time TNT champ, and that makes me better than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It's just like they, they, they really just diminished that championship yeah. belt. It, like, it has, whereas you look at like the TBS championship belt, like Jade Cardgill, she's what, like, 62 and all right now. I mean, uh, she's not fought anybody and like, it's an inflated number. It's, it's very Goldberg esque. So it's like, it's what it is, but at least she's not like handing that belt off to sky blue every week. You know what I'm <laughs> saying? All right. It's just, I just, I don't know. Anyways, uh, one of our favorite guys to He's now part of the elite, maybe in looking to take down the Blackpool combat club. What is going on here? Like, I, I I think when this when this story is all said and done, right? When we figure out all the moving pieces, because I feel like right now we have we've got like three pages of a book that we are reading. I think once we figure it all out, it's going to be an incredible story. But you have Don Callis coming down to the ring to take out a, a BCC that that has kind of duped the elite and and has. Uh, basically attack them from the back only to, to run back, drop his chair, run back to the back and come out with Takeshita and Takeshita just clears the ring. He looked like he belonged, which was awesome. And I was excited for him to me. I, I think you, you did need the commentary for this. A lot of times I think the commentary with, with AEW, especially with Tony Schiavone and, and some of the other evolving guys that they have at that booth, I think you can just kind of mute them. I don't think Tony Schiavone adds a whole lot of anything. I think Scalibur is good. I think Taz is great. Um, but I think you need a little bit of commentary here because they tell you that Takeshka is being brought in to help push out any chance of Hangman Page. And I think you kind of – you needed that because otherwise – I'm not 100% sure that that we know that, but I liked seeing Takeshita uh, in the ring with the elite, and I liked him getting a getting a spotlight, getting a bit of a moment to really throw around the BCC. What did you What did you make of this? Because I thought this was a great way to really highlight a guy who you and I are incredibly high on, and think that they can do a ton of stuff with. I thought this was was fantastic. In the end. I think the best story writing for this would be for Takeshita and and Don Callis to basically be the guys controlling the BCC and and being the master puppeteer and basically trying to take down the elite. I think that would be a fantastic twist and a fantastic swerve and an awesome story. But we'll see what happens. I thought this was a great way to really highlight a, a up and coming wrestler, a guy, if you will, who should be on that pillars list. Yeah, great, and, and, and obviously that when he's come in, he's caught the attention of the people at the top. Everybody wants to work with him. Everybody wants to see what he's about. And that's what it, what it's about. And it, it, it plays out great. I thought that uh, Kenny Omega in this feud, I think it's it's a feud that you can get interested in. And it's it's a reliable and tried and true feud that you can have top guys feud against each other. And I can't wait to see how it plays out. And Takeshka in the mix is going to be great. I think that all in all, this has a chance to be a great story told that keeps people invested and interested. Yeah, I think it will be – this will be a, a long-term story build too, and I think it's going to be interesting. This is going to be one of those main event stories that I think is going to take some time. We might get two or three pay-per-views out of it, and I'm cool with that because if it's done well – and look, everybody involved in this is is pretty great. I think they can tell a really, really good story. So it will be really, really interesting to kind of see what happens. Also, these guys – the rumor is these guys will all be staying on Dynamite when they go to add that third show 
the CM Punk channel will be on Saturdays. Uh, but these guys collectively, the elite and the BCC will be remaining on dynamite to work together because none of them want to deal with CM Punk. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more of that a little bit later on. I think, uh, I, I need to get your your perspective on what we got between Adam Cole and Chris Jericho because you you go back two weeks and you kind of have this weird little inter- interaction. Then you go back last week, you have the same interaction, just vice versa. I thought this was a great way to kick off a feud between Adam Cole and Chris Jericho. This was this was brutal. This was this was mean. This was nasty. You got the darkest side of Chris Jericho that you could get. And I think Adam Cole in his promo gave you a little tidbit. I didn't realize that Bay Bay was because of Chris Jericho, that that was Chris Jericho inspired. After hearing that, I'm like, that totally makes sense. I've been a fan of Adam Cole for freaking years. I never put two and two together. I thought this was a really good setup for whatever their feud's going to be. I thought the beatdown of Adam Cole, the the the, the beatdown – of Britt Baker. I thought it was, was good. I don't necessarily think the actual beating down of Britt Baker was good. I thought Soraya looked weak when she was doing it. I thought Britt Baker sold her ass off to make that look good. But overall, I thought the, the concept and the idea and the direction that we are going, I love this. I, I, I don't know if you do, but I thought this was, was really, really interesting. I thought this was a really good way to basically take a feud that really didn't have anything going on. Like they hadn't exchanged any words. They hadn't really talked. They hadn't really done. They side eyed each other for two weeks in a row. And then next thing you know, you got Chris Jericho basically handcuffing Adam Cole to the ring ropes and beating the shit out of him and his girlfriend. I thought, all right, cool. Statement made. Let's go. Now we got a feud. Now we got some anger. Let's fight. Good enough for me. I liked it. What did you think? Yeah, absolutely, man. Whew. I'm curious. How do you think it should play out? And all, and, and, and how, how should it end? Who should go over? Well, I, I would say that Adam Cole has to go over, right? Uh, I think when it's all said and done, Adam Cole has to go over. Look, don't be surprised if this is one of those like best two out of three type of deals, right? Chris Jericho gets the first win. Uh, Adam Cole is just a little bit emotionally wound tight. Uh, Adam Cole ends up coming back and taking the, 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 the second one because he figures some stuff out. And then... Almost like a, almost like a, like a, like a Rocky story, right? Uh, Britt Baker for the third one's got to come down and just be like, just give it everything you got. And Adam Cole ends up somehow getting a win and, and basically takes the feud from Chris Jericho. That's kind of how I would play it out. I would do something long-term with this because I think this could be really, really good. I think Adam Cole is, is fantastic. I thought them adding Britt Baker to this story was great. I thought adding Britt Baker to this was was fantastic because you have you have the the all access television show and you kind of see a little bit behind the scenes. You see you see their relationship and you see how important they are to each other. I think it's a great way to work that that real lifeness into the television program and it just gives you another layer. And the more real it is the more interesting and captivating it is. A lot of times we talk about it, the stuff that happens behind the cameras, behind the scenes, behind stage, that stuff is usually way better than anything we get on television. So I think it adds just another level. I look, I love this. I think this is, this is, this could be really, really good for Adam Cole. Also, Chris Jericho is an incredibly safe worker. Adam Cole is coming back from having an awful concussion, which has basically derailed almost a year of his life. Chris Jericho is an incredibly safe worker and Chris Jericho can put matches together to help protect Adam Cole's head and get him into a spot where he just feels a little bit more comfortable in the ring. I think it's a good choice. I think it's really, really good. Also, Chris Jericho can help just catapult stars like Adam Cole is already a star. This can just shoot him into superstardom. Also, Chris Jericho can come out looking good after a loss to Adam Cole. So I I love this. I think this is fantastic for both of these guys. Yeah, it's it's great to see and, and it's believable. You know, Chris Jericho, I think can elevate Adam Cole. Um, his heel, I guess the way in which he delivered it was okay, but I think he could just be a little bit more serious. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Yeah. Chris, Jer- Chris Jericho could be like. Uh, it just came off a little bit more performancey in my mind. I thought that he could be a little bit more stern, 
just in the fact that I'm better than you and and just to be a little bit more it just came off as more entertainment entertainment style of, of delivering his his thing. I just think that Chris Jericho. But also remember, he's supposed to be a sports entertainer. That's yeah. part of the reason why yeah. he ended up bringing out Soraya I, and all of them because yeah. they run counter to to what AEW is supposed to be. AEW is supposed to be a wrestling company. He's a sports entertainer. Yeah, and the that, other three girls are right. from the other organization. Right, and so it just Chris Jer- I just can't wait to see the match. It, it, it would have been nice to maybe see five years ago, but hey, Adam Cole, uh, he's he's over and he's got what it takes, and it's going to be a feud that I think that has a chance to be really exciting and add to the list of things that are positive for AEW. Yeah, I think this will be a. I think this will be a really good match. I think this will be awesome. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, what was your show of the week this week? For me, I thought it was a SmackDown. I thought it ran smooth. I thought uh, underrated was Gunther versus a uh, member of the New Day. I thought that you know giving opportunities to wrestlers who don't typically get opportunities is great. And you realize that you know the King of the Ring angle was great, but they just kind of moved away from it real fast. And with Kofi and Big E gone, hey, then you got an opportunity for you know the new day to kind of stay alive and on television have good matches and that's what's good is that you have you have a real solid mid-card performer and you can handle business and gunther is just a star so it, it was great i thought smackdown you know yes predictable at times but in the end it flowed well and i thought it was it, it was a good show uh, I thought SmackDown was a good show. I thought Dynamite was a better show. I think if you get a chance, yeah. if you have to watch one, I would I would recommend Dynamite. Um, I don't think you'll be wrong either way. I think both were were both very very good programming. Uh, so you can check out either one of those shows. Uh, would you like some news and notes? Hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list? A major WWE star may be setting the table to leave the company. As we lightly touched on last week, Drew McIntyre's contract is coming up, and his relationship with WWE may be breaking down. It has previously been reported that McIntyre's contract is up this year and that he's unhappy with his position in the company, with former WWE champion also backing blacking out his Twitter account and removing WWE references from his bio. McIntyre has been out of action since WrestleMania 39, reportedly to recover from injury issues. Sounds like there were multiple injuries. Uh, Dave Meltzer has now provided an update on the Drew McIntyre situation on Wrestling Observer Radio, saying he's not going to be back on TV next week. He's not going to be back for a couple more weeks. They announced Madison Square Garden show, which is in July, and he was not announced for that show either, but that's not necessarily. I was just told... It's a couple more weeks, and we'll see what happens from there. There is an injury. There is a contract issue. Although the contract issue has, con- although the contract issue, his contract doesn't come due for many, many months. But as far as signing a new deal, there's nothing new. They're still far apart. Uh, now this could be a big blow to the WWE roster and a major pickup for a rival promotion, say like AEW. If he was to go over there, we'll have to follow the situation and keep you updated as the info breaks. Some injury news on major WWE star Becky Lynch missed Monday Night Raw this week as she is dealing with a minor foot injury that is getting progressively worse. Recently, Lynch took to Twitter, blacked out her account and changed her name to Rebecca Quinn, which fueled speculation that she was unhappy and looking to leave WWE. Seems like anytime anybody updates their Twitter, everybody thinks that somebody's leaving the company that they work for. I guess this is what you get when you got two decent companies doing wrestling. It's a good time. Uh, Sticking with injury news, this WWE NXT champion will be sidelined for a while. Robert Bobby Roode had his C5 and C6 vertebrae fused in late 2022 with a post on Instagram confirming that news. Fightful Select has provided an update on the return of Roode, writing, For those asking about Bobby Roode, he's been sidelined for a year but didn't get his fusion until late last year. Uh, He is expected to be out quite some time. Rude hasn't wrestled since June of 2022 and was last seen facing Omos at a WWE house show. So let's throw Seth Rollins in a match with Omos. Should be good. Try to get him up there. Boost him. Let's go. Uh, Someone else bouncing back from injury and doing it locally is Big E. The former WWE tag team champion and WWE champion, will be the in-house MC at Ford Field for the Michigan Panthers USFL football games. Big E has been out of action for well over a year now as he recovers from a broken neck. 
Uh, so that's some big, exciting news. Big E is going to be here locally, going to be the, the basically the in-house entertainment going around asking fans questions. So if you get down to a Michigan Panthers game, you'll get a chance to see Big E. Now, it sounds like we have a return date for CM Punk. Punk himself is coming back from a triceps injury after All Out, as well as a suspension from being a douche in the post pay-per-view or the post yeah the post pay-per-view presser and causing a fight in the back between himself and the elite according to dave Meltzer in the latest wrestling observer newsletter punk is scheduled for saturday june 17th at the united center in his hometown of chicago this may be the kickoff of the saturday show we believe to be called aew collision so at some point aew will probably be running three shows good luck with that because you can't figure out your second show Should be a good time. We'll see what happens. That's going to do it for this week's wrestling news and notes and all of my shitty commentary. Sorry, guys. Make sure you follow Adam for more shitty commentary at Adam (laughs) R-S-T-R-O-Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you agree or disagree, hit us up. A lot of people have differing opinions regarding superstars, angles. Please feel free to hit us up. We love having the debate. Whether you believe WWE creative is on point, whether you believe Vince is uh, a legend and should be heralded a lot more than we do here at Doc and Jock. So let's let's enjoy it. I enjoy the banter. Everything's great in the world of professional wrestling, especially with how these two companies are trying to maneuver and compete against one another. Anywhere that you listen to your favorite audio content, make sure you subscribe. All you got to do, type in three words, Detroit Sports Podcast, and our content will find you. The road to SummerSlam is coming. It's going to be a great time for WWE. AEW has a pay-per-view headlined by MJF, probably going to be going up against Sammy Guevara. I hope that that is going to be the case. Two great companies doing some great things. And also pay attention to what's going on at Impact. They got a new world champion, good angles going on. And they have, uh, even though they're still a distant third, they're still doing some good things in elevating talent and running themselves. They're running the company the right way. And Bully Ray's having himself a little bit of a renaissance. Still is over 50 years old, so to, to have another run is great, but you still want to elevate some more stars over there. And the big impact news, Nick Aldis is back. And for me, I think he's got to take this opportunity in the next couple years for however long he's now with uh, Impact Take these couple years, turn 38, 39, and you got to make a run at WWE. He is perfect. He literally is perfect to go uh, to go over there to, uh, to, to the WWE and work in that system. He'd be perfect at NXT for a year, and then boom, you have, you have a star. Just follow Nick Aldis. So, if you don't know anything about Nick Aldis, watch his tape. He's got it all. He's great. He's great. So WWE, before Vince got involved again, he was supposed to be going there. Yes, that was yes. that was what the rumors were. He was going. Triple H is huge on him. Yes, you have to be. But Vince has Vince has gotten involved. There's a bit of a hiring freeze yes, there because yes, yes. they're trying to figure things out with the merging of both companies. Yes, and I don't know if Vince is as high on him as Triple H is. So it's, it's one of those happen. things that. That has to be, you have to wait and watch and see what happens. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. So make sure you pay attention to Impact. And it's still, they're still running good shows and doing things the, the right ways. For the Jock Adam Strozinski, I'm the Doc John Macaroon. Always enjoy bringing you guys great wrestling content. Mouth breathing, mouth of Macomb, signing out. Can't wait to talk to you guys next week on the next episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.